Good morning. Welcome to RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse, host of our ongoing conversation about disruption, innovation, and how technology is changing everything around us. This is a milestone for us. This is our 50th episode of RBC Disruptors. A little show. Yes, applaud. This is a little show that we started four or five years ago. And here we are today, uh, continuing the conversation. And we thought for the 50th show that we'd turn the conversation on, the, on its head. This isn't going to be about technology. It's not really about the disruptors. This is going to be about you, the audience, and how critical the audience is today, even with all the power of technology that we've been talking about through the last 49 episodes. I uh, can't think of many people better to talk about this than the co-heads, the co-CEOs of the Toronto International Film Festival, because no sector is coming to grips with the challenge of technology and audience quite like film. So Cameron Bailey, Joanna Vicente, welcome to RBC Disruptors. It's great to, great to have you here. Thank you. If any of you got to, uh, who, who went to TIFF last month here? Great. You guys did right. too. You can put your hands up. We were there. Yeah. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> you, can't de you can't deny it. Half a million people, 500,000 people uh, out on the streets and in the cinema halls of Toronto enjoying movies. And that begs the question, why on earth are people still going to movies when we can all sit at home in our basements or wherever watching films, great films on our, on our uh, phones, on our TVs, on our laptops? Could do the same here to our audience on WebEx and Facebook. Welcome. You're part of our audience too. You're showing how audiences can be live and, 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 and virtual. But whether it's sports, film, or events like RBC Disruptors, we're still seeing the power of audience. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why do people still want to, uh, want to come together? Uh, but Cameron, Joanna, thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, let me start, as we like to start all of our conversations here, with some, uh, we call them snappers, just quick questions to get the conversation going. I won't ask you your favorite film at TIFF, because that's like asking your favorite kid. <laughs> you may have one, but you're not allowed to say it on stage. Correct. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe share with us um, your favorite moment from, uh, from, from this year's uh, TIFF. Joanna, can I, can I start with you? So this was my first festival on this side of things. I used to be a producer. I had many films at the festival. So I had a lot of favorite moments. I have to say, you know, like introducing Hustlers and bringing a female filmmaker, which every time I did that, we really got a lot of applause from the audience because we had so many of the galas directed by women. And then just bringing that level of talent, like the excitement, like it was just the audiences. You could feel the energy in the room yeah. when um, Laureen, the filmmaker, comes in and then brings, you know, Jennifer Lopez and, and uh, Constance Wu. So that was definitely where you, you, you really felt uh, the, the energy was one of uh, my favorite moments, mm -hmm. yes. Cameron, favorite, uh, favorite moment? Uh, that was a great moment, and I'm glad that we were able to do that, and, and Joanna was there for, uh, for that as well. You know, we have uh, about 240 films in the festival. There was one that I really liked. We have a section called Platform, which is, a, is our competitive section. At the festival, we opened it this year with a film called Rocks from the UK. It's got no stars in it, uh, so, you know, no J-Lo, no, no Cardi B or anything like that, but it's just a group of, of young girls, uh, high school girls uh, from London, true, um, a story based on their real experiences of growing up, of coming from immigrant families where sometimes your, your life is precarious. You have to go to high school and present a certain face, and then at home you've got a very difficult life sometimes. It's that story. They all came. The director, Sarah Gavron, was there. It was the world premiere. There were about 20 uh, girls and women on the stage who were involved in making the film either on screen or behind it. Um, we uh, engage our next wave group, which is a group of high schoolers in Toronto from lots of different backgrounds all over the city. They were helping to present the film. It was just this incredible coming together of youth and it really was inspiring because the festival can sometimes feel like it's for people who are a little bit older, have the, the means to attend, but this was really young people invading the festival and it was really exciting to see. Maybe talk a bit more about that because we're, we're, we're here to look at audience and how audiences in a way are disrupting the, uh, the disruptors. So Cameron, let me stay with you on, the, on that point of kind of your favorite audience moment 
from, from this year's TIFF? Um, God, there were so many. Um, let me see. Uh, Midnight Madness is probably one of the craziest audiences that we have. And if you have, haven't had that uh, opportunity, please make sure you do it next time you go to the festival. These films start at 11.59 every night. And uh, it's at the Ryerson Theater, 1,200 people, packed house in most cases. And we had one film that I made sure to, to show up for at the end of a long day. I, I went around to Ryerson at midnight. And the programmer, Peter Kaplowski, had found this film from Uganda. And the very first time we had a Midnight Madness film uh, from Uganda. And these guys in Uganda make these super low budget films. And by low budget, I mean less than $1,000 to make a movie. <laughs> and they just gather their friends together. Nobody gets paid, but they do it for fun. And what they also do is when they make these crazy B-movie action films, they narrate them live. And so there's a guy on stage as the movie's playing, and he's talking it up. He's kind of like being the hype man to the movie <laughs> as he's watching it. And we're all a part of that. And then they, they um, Skyped into Uganda, into Kampala, uh, at the end of the film, and it was morning there, and so the, the people who had made the film there were also talking back to the audience in Toronto. It was just a perfect uh, audience moment for me. So can you come to our next Disruptors and be our hype guy? And, <laughs> and that, that, that's a fantastic that. idea. <laughs> jo Joanna, your favorite uh, audience moment at this year's TIFF? At this year's TIFF. Um, I introduced a lot of the, the galas. We were splitting all the introductions of the galas, so I did a, you know, I was, uh, not as much with the smaller films, which as a producer, I did so many of those. So I think all of my moments are a bit more like high profile. I guess introducing Bruce Springsteen, That's all right. uh, who <laughs> co-directed a film. So in a way, it was his di directorial debut, mm -hmm. um, his first film. So he was actually nervous because he was presenting something that he hasn't done before. Um, and, and, and just like, it was like combining film festival, rock concert. It was just crazy. Like everyone just stood up with their phones and yeah, it was uh, intense. <laughs> so we want our audience to be part of this conversation. If you have questions, please share them uh, through our Facebook page. Same with our audience on Facebook Live and on WebEx. Uh, we'll get the questions up here on the screen and uh, be sure to insert them in the conversation. I wonder if I can get your thoughts uh, a bit on the history of TIFF. It's, it, it's known generally as the People's Festival. There's lots of great glitzy festivals around the world, but none quite like TIFF. And uh, I've, I've been going for many years. It didn't necessarily start out that way, but it's grown mm -hmm. phenomenally. And when I go, I'm always impressed with the crowds on the street, of course, for the red carpets, I get that. Uh, for the Springsteen moments, I get that. But those midnight madness moments are fantastic, where you go into a packed theater at midnight for a, a film from Uganda, for instance, and people love it. But give us a bit of insight, Cameron, uh, on the, the evolution of the People's Festival, especially with the audience in mind. How did TIFF get to be what it is yeah. today? So it was started by three guys uh, who used to attend the Cannes Film Festival uh, just about every year. They were in the film industry, um, Dusty, um, uh, uh, cool. Dusty Cole, uh, Bill Marshall, and Hank Vanderkolk. And they liked what they saw in Cannes, but Cannes is a very ritzy festival. It's just for the industry. It's not a public festival at all. But they liked the excitement. They liked the, the fact that, that you could go and discover new directors and new films there. They wanted to bring that back to Toronto, but to make it Toronto. And so that meant that it had to be more of a people's festival. It had to be for the public. And they, they br managed to bring those two things together. Uh, started in 1976, and it was hard. The, uh, <laughs> one of the, the great stories is one of the, the, the most influential film critics in Toronto at the time heard that the Toronto Film Festival was happening and took his vacation during the <laughs> festival. He said, I don't need to worry about this. I'm going up north to the cottage or something. Uh, and it really wasn't until American critics started coming up, people like Roger Ebert, who was famously one of the biggest and earliest supporters of our festival, began to write about it and to write about it for the U.S. audience. And then suddenly, uh, Hollywood began to pay attention. And we did tributes to people like uh, Warren Beatty and Martin Scors uh, Scorsese in the early years. And then that attracted more, uh, more momentum. The films were good. And over time, we began to find films that would go on to greater success. Uh, the uh, Prince's Bride premiered at our festival in 1987, and then suddenly everybody began to hear about our festival. Um, Chariots of Fire really blew up out of Toronto and, and went on to great success. And then American Beauty, and then later on Slumdog Millionaire, King's Speech, 
Green Book last year, that success where films launch in Toronto, audiences discover them here, and then suddenly everyone's talking about them and they win awards, including the Oscar. That really was what made Toronto what it is. And, and, and TIFF has this almost magical ability as a predictor or indicator of, of uh, film success. I think the, the number is $3 billion of revenue have been generated off of Tim TIFF films, whereas uh, at Cannes it's uh, 800 million and, and, and change. Yeah. Same with awards, the, the TIFF films win more Oscars than I think any other, any other festival. Joanna, what is it about the TIFF model that al allows it to be that kind of indicator? Well, what I think is really special about TIFF and having been a producer who brought many films here is that it's really unique in that it has absolutely the best public audiences. It's really a public festival. But at the same time, you also have the industry in force here and you have the press. You really have the three most important stakeholders for a film festival. A lot of the other film festivals are industry festivals. So even though there's buzz around the film, you don't really get the sense of how is the film going to resonate with audiences. So which is part of like why a lot of studios, distributors and smaller distributors will choose TIFF as the place to launch the film because you really will get them an idea on how is it going to work. Um, and, 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 and that helps to get the kinds of films that will resonate with audiences, get the, the, the critical acclaim, and then go on to actually get uh, amazing awards. And that's a great. Yeah. I think one of the things that's important to remember is that movies are still very mysterious, even to the people who make them. Right? They make these movies. They make them with a group of people. It can be hundreds of people, but they don't know how they're going to play until they play them in front of a, a public audience. And Toronto is not just a great place to do that because audiences have a, a history of actually identifying those real successes. Uh, but it's a, an audience that's not out to hate your movie, right? Uh, unlike at some other festivals, industry festivals like Cannes, the French in Cannes are famous for being very harsh on movies. And uh, in the old theaters, that you know, the chairs used to snap up when people <laughs> were just leaving the theater because they didn't like it. That doesn't happen at our festival because the audience comes into the theater generously. They want to actually see if you can uh, move them, if you can impress them. And uh, so, you know, films play well here. The audience is interested and engaged with the movies. And I think that's what people want to come here to find out. It was really interesting to be in an audience here and you can feel it, that energy. There, there is a supportive vibe to uh, generally to the festival, but you know when a film is connecting and I assume that's the same for directors and, and producers that are there to get that kind of human yeah, feedback, which is the power of the audience. It yeah. tells you things that maybe data aren't, uh, aren't going to tell you. I wonder if you can give us a sense of, uh, tell us a bit about how you both got into film. Joanna, I'm going to start with, with you. You've had an amazing journey uh, from Portugal originally, lived and worked in New York. Joanna's an award-winning film producer, three seasons, great, uh, great movie um, among many, many others, uh, and then came to TIFF uh, just uh, recently, relatively, as uh, uh, executive director and co-CEO. What attracted you first to film? always loved films, lived in Portugal at a moment of a lot of turmoil and, you know, kind of grew up post-revolution and, and film was kind of my escape. I uh, loved musicals and uh, it was kind of my way of like not dealing with reality and it, even though I didn't study film, I, I studied philosophy and political science. I, you know, while I was in school during the summers I was working for um, a well-known Portuguese producer who actually had a film at the festival this year, Paulo Branco. So film has always been part of part of me. Um, and then um, started producing short films, music videos, public service announcements. Then my first uh, feature film and, and kind of just my career like kind of grew from there. Um, and, and you did something really uh, amazing or interesting in New York with the Made in New York effort and the Independent Filmmakers Project that you ran before coming here. Maybe just give us a quick sense, uh, especially from an audience perspective, of what you were trying to build in, uh, in New York. So I w used to be on the board of the Independent Filmmaker Project, which is an organization, a national organization in the U.S. that supports filmmakers. We have a big awards show the Gotham Awards, we publish Filmmaker Magazine, and we do all kinds of activities to uh, help develop artists. And um, 
And I used to be on the board, and then I kind of stepped in to help and ended up staying for eight years as the executive director. Uh, but in the middle uh, of, of those years, I partnered with the city of New York. They had put an RFP out to create um, a, a space that would kind of embody the Made in New York brand uh, and become a, a place for storytellers, where storytellers and technologists and entrepreneurs would come together uh, and, and, and really think about what the future of film looked like. So, so I put, we put that uh, um, proposal together. We won the RFP and we built the Made in New York uh, Media Center with the city. So we were par we've been partners with the city uh, and we, the organization is still partners with the city. We're gonna come back to this point about storytelling and how in this age of uh, smart machines, uh, human, uh, as humans as storytellers still matter. But uh, Cameron, give us a sense of, uh, of, of your own journey into film. Your own life journey, also very different. Uh, I think born in the UK, uh, grew up part initially in the Caribbean and then here in Toronto, yeah. screenwriter, uh, film critic, and at TIFF uh, for many years, but uh, really driving the creative program, curating. Sure. Uh, the movies that we get to see over the last decade. Yeah, um, I got to Toronto when I was seven years old, lived in the suburbs, uh, North York and then Thornhill and Scarborough, and was always a big reader. I spent a lot of time in the school library, in the public libraries. I was that nerdy kid who would actually go to the library on the weekend and <laughs> hang out there until my mom actually said, you should do something else. Uh, so, uh, and I studied literature at university and thought that was gonna be my career. In fact, I, for a minute, I was gonna be a journalist. That was really what I was hoping to do, like, like yourself. Um, and then I took a film course as part of my English literature degree at Western University, and it was a course on contemporary cinema. Started with Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless and went all the way up to the present at that time, and it was everything that wasn't Hollywood. So it was movies from Europe and Asia and Africa and Latin America, which I had never seen before. I had no exposure to that. I didn't even know that that was a thing, that there were movies being made all over the world and they were not just for entertainment, that movies could do so much more than just entertain. And that got me excited. I started writing about movies for my campus newspaper, parlayed that into a job at Now Magazine when I graduated. And I was a film critic for many years as I began to program for TIFF. But what I liked about programming was that it wasn't just interpreting a film and expressing your opinion about it, but it was actually engaging with the audience. It was actually trying to figure out how is this film going to work on an audience. What kinds of different audiences are there and different audience reactions are there depending on the film? And how do you actually find films to fit audiences and find audiences that are going to respond to the films you're showing? That's the real, I think, challenge of programming and that was really what, what kept me interested in, in this festival. One of the things we've been talking about in the lead up to this conversation is the power of diversity in audiences and that's something we're certainly wrestling with and exploring a lot at RBC. Uh, and we really do see power in diversity and inclusion. And I'm interested to see the audiences here in Toronto. Uh, we know Toronto is among, if not the most uh, diverse city in the world, and you see that in, in, the, in, the, in the audiences at TIFF. How does that affect the audience interplay with a film versus having a homogenous audience? Joanna, you've been dealing with audiences as a filmmaker and now as a, as a uh, film festival executive. How do you see diversity play out for the audience? Well, also being an international festival, we have films f from like 80 84 countries. Four countries. Um, so, so it's great to know that there's such a diverse uh, audience because there's, when you're, I, I mean, I, I didn't do the programming that's really under uh, Cameron's uh, preview, but the idea that there's always an audience that you, you're not seeing as the audience in general, but that there are people that can connect uh, with different films and different subject matters, different topics, you know. Yeah, look, I think there's still more that we can do to actually match the audience demand in this city. This, the city and this region is incredibly diverse. As we know, half the people living in Toronto were not born in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, people are bringing all different kinds of cultural experience, background, including background in stories and in movies, to their life in the city. We want to try to engage with that as much as possible. 
Um, we've done, you know, about uh, 15 years ago, we brought our first big Bollywood film to Toronto, and we had Shah Rukh Khan and Amitabh Bachchan and Karan Johar here, and that was the biggest fan reaction we had that year at the festival, bigger than having Brad Pitt, who was actually also at the festival that year, but that was bigger. <laughs> um, and so you learn from that. We did a, a, a retrospective or a spotlight on, on Nollywood films from Nigeria mm -hmm. a few years ago, and that was also huge. And just the, the fan reaction here and internationally is, is massive, and you want to be able to engage with that as, as uh, much as possible. Anytime we, we show any film with any K-pop singer in an acting role, it's a huge because there's a massive audience for K-pop. Uh, so those kinds of things are things that we react to, and uh, we, you know, we try to reflect that in the programming. Um, but the audiences in Toronto are, are really heterogeneous. It's not just that you know, Koreans are going to, to movies with mm -hmm. K-pop stars in them. Um, I was at the, the Daniel Caesar concert uh, on the weekend, and you know, he's somebody who grew up in Oshawa from a, a Jamaican, uh, Bajan immigrant family, big international R&B star now. The audience was mostly Asian. Right, so that was interesting to me, and very young, like you know, 25 and younger. But you know, these are really romantic songs. They're beautiful songs, and he's a Toronto singer, and Toronto singers attract Torontonians of every stripe, and that's what I think is happening with the film world mm -hmm. as well. So last year, I actually had a film at the festival, a Lebanese film, mm -hmm. uh, Capernaum, that ended up being yeah. uh, nominated for an Academy Award, but. There was a film that resonated in general with audiences, but it was so exciting for us, uh, for, for the, the team of producers and, and, and obviously the director who um, already had a history with TIFF and had won, I think, the Public she Choice did. Award. She did, she won the People's Choice Award. Years, yeah. uh, years ago. To have the Lebanese community come in force was, was incredibly exciting. And that was an extraordinary film, which you could feel from the audience the moment, uh, the moment you saw it. Um, we started off this conversation t uh, with reference to streaming, which is clearly the big disruptor in, uh, in this space, but uh, also takes us away from the audience or a theater of being together. Uh, what are your thoughts on the streaming revolution? And I'll start with you, Cameron, in terms of what it is doing to films, but also to film audiences and sure. how we might have to adjust to that. Um, first thing I'd say is that this is, I, I see this in a kind of historical context, part of a number of different paradigm shifts that have happened over decades and decades. When television was first introduced in the late 40s and early 50s in North America, the movie industry thought, oh my God, we're doomed, right? And they went to great lengths to try to maintain the film audience. When home video came about in the 1980s with the VHS, uh, same thing. The, the film industry thought, oh my God, we're doomed, and tried to come up with a, a, you know, a new way of, of engaging that audience. Streaming is just another way for people to, to watch stories on screen. Uh, they're doing it in large numbers, but that was the same with television, that was the same with VHS videos. I think the film industry will survive. I think it'll have to adapt, of course, but it will definitely survive. And I think people want more than just the, the film on a screen of whatever size, this size or your phone size or you know a 30-foot movie screen. They want the social experience of watching something and immersing themselves in a story with other people laughing together, crying together, being scared together. Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful human desire, I think. I don't think that goes away. Yeah, those are emotions are, are contagious. Mm -hmm. and you have to be with, pe with people. Joanna, how are you kind of thinking through the streaming challenge to live film audiences? So, you know, I think, of course, there's the historical context. So of there's always been these kind of disruptions, and there's always been an answer. Uh, so. To, because there will always be a need for having that kind of immersion into a film in a dark room with a beautiful projection with other people. There's nothing that matches having an audience, you know, uh, laughing or 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 crying or getting scared together. That is more powerful than being in your living room, you know, kind of distracted, multitasking with three <laughs> screens going at once. So, so I think there's always something special about that. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about streaming, so I think like people are watching 80% of feature films at home, um, either on TV or on their laptops. Um, mm. less on their mobile devices just because usually I think up to 20 minutes um, people are spending a lot of time watching video but anything above 20 minutes usually they would go to the bigger screen 
but it also there's also really positive things in that there. Um, kind of SVOD has really liberated uh, and, and, and freed uh, storytellers to tell stories in a, in, a, in a serialized way or longer stories um, that are now free of those kind of TV constraints of being 20 minutes or 40 minutes and time for ads and, and only showing once a week. So you kind of needed to have uh, an arc of a, a story that worked for, for that hour but really didn't do as much character development now that you're able to like binge on a series you actually for some filmmakers it's just a choice it's a 13 hour film mm -hmm. that will be you know divided in different episodes so I which is why I think it's part of why people say this is the golden age of television because there's such exciting storytelling happening there and incredible filmmakers wanting to work in television but what it means for us, having a theater <laughs> or five of uh, theaters, is how do we compel audiences to come to TIFF to really want to experience those unique um, uh, moments and, and watch films with us? To how do we enhance and make it more of an experience and something more unique than you viewing it um, at home, so. so th this idea of the experience economy, probably ev ev everyone's familiar with this, uh, it seems to be touching everything. You go to a sports event now, and it's not just about what's happening on the field. There's something called the in arena or in stadium experience that teams spend a lot of time trying to enhance because people just don't want to sit and watch. Uh, the same in, in, in all sorts of, uh, lines of lines of engagement. When I go to the cinema, one of my favorite moments is when you're kind of ordered to turn your phone off <laughs> and you just get to sit and immerse yourself in the film. That's the, that's the experience. Are we at risk of losing or jeopardizing that true original experience by trying to concoct other ways of engaging, personalizing uh, the experience for the audience through their phones or through other in-cinema activities? I would say it's not so much about the in-cinema experience and amplifying that beyond what you're putting on the screen, but I think the conversation that happens before and after the film is really important. One of the things I think uh, is really powerful about watching movies, especially when you watch them with somebody that you know and care about, is that you, if it's a good movie, you want to talk about it. Yeah. You want to talk about it right afterwards. You'll go out for a drink or dinner or something, and you'll, you'll just discuss you know, what you saw, what, you, what the, you know, your friends or family uh, saw in that film, how it affected you. Uh, your favorite moments, what you hated, all of those kinds of things, that's part of that experience. And that's what we're trying to encourage to the Lightbox as well. We have talkbacks after some of our screenings at the uh, TIFF Bell Lightbox all year round uh, where we generate those conversations, right? We actually, in, uh, we try to sort of spark the debates that will happen naturally between people and get people to sort of think about things that were in the film that they might not have thought about. Because the great thing about movies and maybe any story is that we all see different things when we watch them together which is still remarkable. Tell us a bit about what, you, you mentioned TIFF Lightbox, if you're not familiar with it, it's the, uh, the, the center of TIFF, but it has how, how many uh, screens are? About five there? cinemas. Five, five cinemas there, fantastic place to watch uh, films year round, and what a lot of people don't maybe recognize or appreciate about TIFF is that it's a year round uh, enterprise, it's not just a festival, glitzy festival or people's festival mm -hmm. in September. Uh, Joanna, maybe tell us a bit about your kind of strategic thinking of where you want to, and then I'll get Cameron to jump in, but where do you want to take TIFF as a year-round enterprise going into, going into the 2020s, bearing in mind this challenge of getting people out of their homes, uh, getting them away from their phones to sit down in a cinema and watch and engage in a movie? Well, that, that is the, the main challenge. That is the thing that we think about every day is everything that is programmed there, that there's a reason for it that is unique, that will resonate, that will get people, um, you know, out of their house to see it. We know it's, it's hard to, to get out of the house, that people have kids, they have to get a, a babysitter, like how we, we need to really provide something unique and present it in the absolute best way. Um, so the other thing we know why festival works incredibly well, we obviously have incredible films that show for 10 days, that's that, that kind of urgency of if you don't see it now, you know, you're not gonna see it. Um, it, it, it. It's unique, like how do we kind of 
bring their magic uh, throughout the year? Can we bring some of that excitement, some of that uniqueness of that experience to year round? So um, how do we extend some of the brands mm. that people are more familiar? I remember when I came here last year, and um, a lot of people, both internationally and even here, would say, oh, so you, you, you've been living in New York, so are you just going to spend a couple of months a year? At mm. I'm like, no, this <laughs> is like year round. We have a building. <laughs> uh, we show films and have programs year round. So just um, how do we create that awareness? So, so that's um, some of the things. And, and, and what's working uh, in terms of keeping people engaged year round, getting them to TIFF in, on a cold February evening? I go ahead. I was just going to say, um, one of the things that works is just habit. So we have a, a number of subscription series that we do. Um, one of them is called Secret Movie Club. One's a Real Talk Contemporary World Cinema. We've got a, a Books on Film series as well. You sign up for the whole series, like you do with a, a theater subscription or something like that. And you come every month, uh, and you, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a great movie, sometimes a movie that you haven't seen before or heard of before, and you're going to get some way of kind of opening up and amplifying and illuminating that film from the hosts, uh, from the guest speakers we have with that movie as well. And uh, with the, the morning uh, series that we have, uh, Secret Movie Club and Real Talk, you'll also get bagels. So we have <laughs> breakfast as well. That's also a, a powerful driver, we find. <laughs> Do you have a bagel wall? <laughs> we have no, a donut wall. I'm very <laughs> impressed with the donut wall. I'm going to attack it later. You, you, we, we can swap. We'll do a bagel wall next time, and you can do the, uh, yes. the donut wall. This point about habit is really interesting and something probably every disruptor or innovator is trying to th th figure out. How do I make whatever I'm doing, a service or product, habitual? Because mm -hmm. uh, once you have that, that habit going. What, what do you find, Joanna, is working in terms of building that habit of cinema going in this busy uh, device obsessed age that we live in? Well, we're also a, a, a destination for certain kinds of films. So, you know, there are art house films that will not be shown at the Cineplex or any commercial theater near you. So for people who are interested in really that kind of uh, more art house film, then that's a destination. Then we also have, you know, kind of cinematech programming kind of looking at the classics and the masters of the history of cinema and and that's always ongoing and 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 there are usually organized by team or by a, a, a filmmaker so we have incredible retrospectives coming up uh, one of them being martin scorsese's mm. retrospective while we have the irishman um which just opened the new york film festival is opening in new york to absolute rave reviews a hundred percent uh, Rotten Tomatoes, fresh. Uh, so, so that will in just create a conversation, and people, as they're seeing The Irishman, with you know that brings a, all these actors who've worked with Martin Scorsese throughout his career. Um, like, I think people will be curious to want to see uh, how it all started, you know, and kind of you know these amazing films that he has done for the past whatever. Yeah, 40, 40, 50, 40 plus years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who were maybe not old enough to, to watch the earlier Scorsese films with Robert De Niro, especially years ago. So if you're interested in The Irishman and it's really one of those films of the moment, everybody's in, in the film world is talking about it, and especially the de-aging process, because they've de-aged uh, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci and Al Pacino, then you might want to see those earlier films, and we'll have them on the big screen as well, just showing them the way they were really meant to be seen. So that's a, a way that you can kind of build a habit, because I think there is a natural curiosity that we all have, and, and we try to really appeal to that. If you're interested in just going deeper, in our case in the film world, then we, we have that for you. We can kind of help you learn more and more and just follow your own passions in film through our Cinematheque. Is there a North American challenge, a cultural challenge in getting people out? We were talking earlier about uh, it's kind of the lack of a public square uh, in a lot of North American communities, uh, very unlike uh, Europe, where there's still kind of a, a pride and, uh, and it's very much part of the culture that you go out, you commune. With, uh, with others, Joanne, when, in terms of moving from Europe to North America, what sort of cultural challenges have you seen and how, how should we think about coming to grips with that in the 2020s? 
Uh, I've, I've left Portugal a long time ago, and I was always kind of traveling. Like, I was born in Macau, China. Mm. Uh, so I lived in many, many places. So, um, But seeing the different cultures and, and yeah. s seeing North America, what, uh, well, what's different here? Well, the interesting thing, I think they're both th th New York, and I, I feel also Toronto. They're, these are very kind of multicultural, cosmopolitan cities. Mm. So I felt like those kind of cultural shifts definitely when I went into the middle uh, of America more than I actually feel in New York and Toronto. Um, because I think there is an incredible curiosity and, 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 and people who live in these big urban centers are excited about what is going on in the city. So at least I'm, I'm part of their group, so yeah. that's, uh, so I, I actually feel like we're all, at least in New York, kind of rushing and feeling that we're always missing out on something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's New York. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some of that's in Toronto as well. There is this, this sense of curiosity, but there's also a sense of trying to just accumulate experience uh, in Toronto. Toronto's not just a place um, that's, you know, the biggest city in, in Canada in terms of the cultural opportunities here, but it's also a place that attracts curious, passionate, kind of driven people. Uh, and so, you know, on our staff, we've got people who they'll, they'll work a full day, They're, it's a very challenging job, and then they'll go off and they'll take belly dancing classes or tap dance or learn about pottery or learn about, you know, uh, ancient Samaria or something like that. People want mm. to soak up knowledge and experience. Um, we did a whole strategic process uh, a couple of years ago where we identified different audience segments. The, the, the true film lovers who love film above any other experience, any other art form. And then there are what we call seekers who just want to learn about everything. They just want to soak it all up because that's what they see life as offering. Um, and we appeal to that. If you want to learn about the world through cinema, we have contemporary world cinema. You want to learn about politics. You want to learn about uh, the human mind and the human heart. We can help you do that because we think that that natural curiosity is just really kind of just uh, you know a constant force. And related to that, a question from our Facebook audience about the rise of streaming and why does the theater formula still still work? Maybe Cameron, we can stay with you for that. I think part of it's sensory. Uh, I think no matter how good your home theater is, it's not as good as what we have, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just being in front of this massive 30-foot screen, surround sound, the rumble of the bass, just the, it's like when you go to a concert, it's just a better sound system. You know, you can access the music anytime you want on your phone, but you don't feel it the same way. You don't feel films the same way unless you're in a really good movie theater, and we have that. And then the other thing is the social experience because if we don't share our experiences, then what are they really, right? If, if you experience a great meal or a great piece of music and nobody that you care about felt the same thing, then what do you have? You have something that's very isolating, right? And so sharing those experiences is so important. That's a beautiful insight. If we don't share our experiences, they're not really experiences. Joanna, what, uh, what in the theater formula is still, is still working in, in, in your mind? Well, I think this immersion, I feel like we are constantly distracted, we are constantly multitasking, we are, you know, I see myself, you know, I'm, I'm a news junkie watching the news and at the same time I'm doing email and I'm like, you know, cooking or doing something else, like we, we constantly do, like we can't really be paying attention, you can't watch a film that way, you can't like really get immersed and, 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 and feel empathy for the characters and, and and go into a journey if you are doing 10 other things. So I think when we do, when we're not distracted, when we actually surrender to the experience, mm. something happens. And, and, and then we leave with, with that. And then three days later, we might be still like, oh my God, that was so interesting. That really made me think about. Mm. And, and, and those are really powerful moments. And, and I think mm. any of us have those moments uh, where we saw a film that like, made something shift yeah. or, or changed a little like how we see things. I think that long-term effect that you talk about is really important. Whenever anything major happens in our lives, one of the first things we say is, my God, that was like a movie. <laughs> because you see a car accident, you've seen it in movies. You've seen you know, a knockdown, drag out fight between two people who love each other. You've seen that in movies. You know, most of our big experiences, the most dramatic things that we experience, we have memories of them from watching them in movies. And, that, and so those reference points become really important to us because they shape how we live in the world. Mm. 
Joanna, you mentioned earlier about, or you referred to earlier, the, uh, the golden age of television. Uh, and I want to turn the conversation to the future of filmmaking. You're a filmmaker. You think a lot about this. You've worked on this. Where is it all this taking filmmaking? I'm curious with it. We don't refer to the golden age of filmmaking right now. Well, I think filmmaking is always being reinvented. And, and, and there are incredible artists working. And some of them are actually kind of moving fluidly between working on television and film. <gasps> and they're less concerned about what is one or the other. For them, they're storytellers. They're creating a, a story. Um, I think just um, I kind of lost my <laughs> train of thought, but uh, I had s s wanted to say something about, um, sorry, you just asked. Uh, on, the, on the golden, sorry, I'm losing my on, voice on here. The so. like <coughs> Um, all right, Cameron, why don't you go? Yeah. I'll, I, I wanted to say something, but I kind of lost it. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a revolution in, in TV making, the, the, the binge-worthy shows, what streaming is doing to uh, television, and, and the blurring or convergence of what was known as TV and, and filmmaking. Maybe that's all for, for the better. But curious, what, as a filmmaker, how is this changing the art, the art form? You know, I think kind of on the negative side of things, I think it's kind of worrisome that, you know, people will inevitably, with so much data, start seeing about things that resonate with audiences more and, and moments and what's working and what's not working. And, and also creating those, like everyone wants personalization. They don't have the time to uh, choose, go through Roku mm -hmm. and look at uh, hundreds of apps and choose what film you're going to see. So if someone, if Netflix or Apple or Amazon is telling you, you like these, you're going to like these too. But what that does is sometimes you're going to like these two is very similar to what you liked and it's not really going to stretch and, and, and create that kind mm -hmm. of moment that we were talking on. You're seeing something new. You're being kind of stretched. You're being challenged. So. That, those are the things that worry me that when you have companies <coughs> like, um, that are, their business model is like they're looking at, at script, they're evaluating scripts to see if these scripts, you know, like have all of the beats of all of the successful films and predicting box office. So that gets a little, because that messes up with what creativity does. And, and, and there are so many examples of films, as we were talking earlier, that don't follow. Um, all of those beats and end up being incredibly successful in that they resonate with audiences. On the other hand, I feel because there are all of these new players coming in, that there is a real need for content. So I think it's also a great time for filmmakers because everyone needs <coughs> more content to put in those pipelines. Cameron, you've been a student of film for, for years, as you said earlier. How, how do you see filmmaking evolving going into the 2020s, given all these technologies and the platforms that are, are changing? Sure. I mean, I think in terms of audiences, there's a number of different strands happening at the same time, and they intersect in some ways. So blockbuster movies are still a thing, and I think will continue to be a major factor for a long time. And you know, you could say that started with the Jaws, or you could say that started with Birth of a Nation, or you know, <laughs> going back however many <coughs> decades. But the idea of a movie that everybody feels like they have to see and and experience, that's still continuing, and it'll be Marvel movies for the next uh, you know little while, and then it'll be something else. At the same time those big communal experiences are intersected with very personal, what we call long tail experiences, where you have people who are devoted fans of just one thing that seems to be niche. It might be they're into you know, anime from the 1980s only, do you know what I mean? Or they, they might be into you know, contemporary French horror movies or romantic comedies from India or whatever it might be. Uh, that's also something that, that intersects with that massive blockbuster common experience, and then there are people choosing uh, and curating their own kind of world of content. What they're going to choose is their, their movie orbit, if you want to call it that, um, from all of the different things that are available. As you said, there are thousands and thousands of movies available on each of your phones as soon as you want. As soon as this is over, you can start watching a movie if you want. Um, but we, we, have to, we have to get past the challenge of the choice, right? There's just there's too much choice. And that's where curation really matters, and that's what we try to offer at TIFF, not just at the festival, but all year round, is 
you know, choosing what we think are some of the best things and the a range of them, and then you can you know, select from within that. Within that. And how, how are you wrestling with the challenge of curation given all the data? I, when you say curation, I immediately think of the Netflix recommendation engine, right. which is a, uh, a, a curatorial <laughs> machine. Has its flaws. Has its, I say. Absolutely, I, I see those flaws. <laughs> How do you balance just your own instincts and the instincts of your t team when you see something up against those powerful machines and all the data that powers them? I, mean, I think for us, our programming team for the festivals is 21 people and year round. It's smaller than that, but still a range of people. So I think the first thing is you hire people who have a range of experience. If you've got groupthink when it comes to curation, you're lost. You have to have a range of people in terms of ages, generations, background, taste, all of those things so that you have a much wider perspective on what audiences will like. And then you have to listen to actual audiences. So we try to put our programmers and our, our team in front of audiences as often as possible, make sure they're hearing them, whether they are people who are coming in for one screening or they're patrons who've been with us for 30 years. So when you say put them in front of audiences, what, well, what do you mean? Well, introduce the films, be there for the Q&As, uh, be part of surveys and feedback sessions. Uh, we've got member meetups where we actually have our staff sit with our TIFF members and listen to how they're reacting to films. All of those things are ways of staying current with what our audiences are looking for. And that, I think, is the combination of listening to your audience and actually having a range of people curating that's better than any recommendation engine, as far as I know. So I, I can't let an audience question on Game of Thrones pass by. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let either or both of you field this. Is there an ability to bring long-form films with complex plots, like Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. to the theater? Well, I think it's something we're going to be exploring is like, are there other non-film activities that are related to storytelling that we can bring into the light box um, so that we kind of, again, also break a little bit our own uh, constraints of showing feature films that are one and a half to two and a half hours. Uh, can we actually hash, you know, create that communal experience of people watching, you know, a full season of something? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the a filmmaker that that we feel uh, makes sense for. Yeah, I think I think this also speaks to the idea of, of uh, event uh, watching, and Game of Thrones was certainly an event this year with the end of this, the the show. Mm -hmm. Um, we're always interested in that. We've done things in the past where, you know, the, the, I think the launch of season two of Stranger Things, we presented on the big screen at the light box. We had the entire Raptors finals in our movie theater on the, uh, on the big screen for audiences for, <laughs> for free, which was amazing. Uh, so things like that where we know that there's a lot of uh, audience interest and you're kind of capturing a moment in time, we definitely want to always do. I wonder if we can go back to the point, or stay with the point about data and how that is driving decisions in filmmaking. Uh, one of our earlier guests on Disruptors was uh, Alan Lau from, from Wattpad, uh, who you know well, and it's, it's, it's fascinating what they're trying to do with script development, uh, using uh, sort of crowdsourcing for it, but also testing using data uh, and trying to convince studios that this is maybe a better way of uh, developing scripts. Uh, I can certainly see the power of that, but also the flaws. And wondering how you both think about the evolution of data-driven decision making with just that instinctive, instinctual human decision making, the gut. Uh, and is there a way of bringing them together? Do they work together or do they uh, clash? Maybe Cameron, I can start yeah, with Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not afraid of it. I think it's, it's an interesting new development, but it's building on things that have gone before. People have been studying stories for probably thousands of years. Um, and there's a famous book Joseph, by Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, which looks at narrative generally through hundreds of years previously. And that, that study of narrative was the model for Star Wars. So if you watch Star Wars and what Luke goes through in that movie, it, he's following an ancient tradition of stories. Mm -hmm. And what Pat is essentially just doing that. What are the common elements in stories, what works with audiences, what do we want to see, what is the danger, what are the risks, at what point do stories need to change and shift to keep the audience interested, that's something we've always been doing. Uh, thankfully, I think, we don't have the final answers. We don't know what the perfect story formula is, and if we did, I think we just need to all just sort of turn in. And, you know, there's, <laughs> there's so many formulaic films with amazing actors that totally flop. And sometimes it's just like there's no spark. There's no chemistry. There's, n there's not that thing that makes people fall in love with something. Um, and, and, and that's the hard part. And, and I don't know. 
And uh, as a producer and as a, a festival executive, do you know that when you're kind of making or wrapping up the film, or is it only when it goes before the audience you realize, yeah, there's no spark here? <laughs> you know, for me, it all like started with the script. Um, I think things kind of tend to go, go downhill from the script. You really need to start with a very, with a great uh, property, and and we only, my husband and I used to work together. We only produced film scripts. We would only like pursue something if that script like couldn't like uh, if we couldn't sleep after we read something because we were either so excited or 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 kind of sometimes we couldn't even name what it was but it was just like why do I keep thinking about this and then I'm like I guess that really had an impact on me that we only did films that we we that really woke something up on us that mm. that 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 was different and then we kind of trusted that instinct and um, and you know put the best teams together make work with the filmmaker to make sure that we could really like unlock the all potential of, of making that film amazing, giving them all the tools and, and challenge them when needed to, to really uh, make something great. And then there's that moment where you've never seen it with an audience. And, and sometimes we, we of course showed film <coughs> these rough cuts just to start getting feedback. And that's really powerful. And, 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 and you know, it's a process. You don't get it right, you know, at first. You, you have to work on it, work on it until somehow you feel like, okay, I think we can walk away now. Um, and then, you know, some films really resonate with audiences and some less. Um. Mm. So we, we've got, unfortunately, a minute left. This is a, a great conversation. And you both talked a lot about diversity. Uh, and TIFF is extraordinary in terms of what it is doing to champion diversity among filmmakers. The audience, uh, as you said, is kind of uh, uh, heterogeneous on, on, on its own. But Joanna, I wonder if you can share with us uh, your, your thoughts on championing uh, women in film, the initiative you've just launched. What, uh, just tell us briefly about it and what, what's your ambition for it? So the initiative actually was launched in 2017, Share Your Journey, and was really, as you know, I was looking at the whole proposal of coming to TIFF, there was definitely something that I felt very passionate about. I feel like um, as a producer, being a woman producer, that it impacted the kinds of films that I made, the, the people that I hired. I had you know, a lot of uh, cinematographers and production designers that were women. Um, it's a lot harder for women to get their films made. Um, Why is that? Film school, 50-50. You know, 50% of the students are women, and then you know it, it's just harder to, I guess, get financing, get teams, get the the first film made, and then when you get the fil first film made, then men like usually on average like they take one and a half years to get to their second film. Women take between five and seven years. Um, what happens? I don't know. Life, it's just, it's, it's harder. Maybe we, you know, it's been harder for women to, to get people on board, to say, I have an idea, just follow me, <laughs> and, uh, and, and get financiers to, to trust. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The, I think the, the pipeline is there. There are a lot of women with a lot of talent. We see that, like, starting at film school. So how do we work with the industry? How do we give those opportunities for women to feel more confident, more validated with their projects so that they can get made? Um, so I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. We share our journey. I think we need to have you back for future disruptors on, on, on that particular topic because there's lots to explore there. I wonder if you could both just wrap up with a quick thought for all of us sort of dealing with audiences near or far. As we enter the 2020s with technology more powerful, with more data than we've ever had, what should we be really thinking about? Cameron, I'll start with you in terms of keeping and developing that audience magic. I think I like that it's complicated. Um, later this fall, we will have an exclusive run of the new Martin Scorsese film, The Irishman. The light box will be, will be the only place in Toronto that you can see it. This is a film that in some ways was driven by data. It's a Netflix film, so that's, that's the most data-driven content company that we know of right now. 
Uh, but it's also the product of a master filmmaker working with some of the greatest actors in American cinema history. So there's a long history to the making of this movie, but it is up to the minute in that it's a Netflix film. And we're showing it theatrically in the light box. So that to me is where we are right now. There's all of these different strands being woven together. It's complicated, but the result is there's a great movie to see at the end of it. Right. Joanna, what should we be thinking about for audience? I think it, it, it's, I think you need to take risks um, because it's the biggest payoff is when we take risks, it, is when we challenge audiences to get a little bit out of their comfort zone and that's where I feel transformation can happen. Um, so I hope that, you know, sometimes data can make us safe um, to just push a little bit the envelope. That's a great uh, message to, to leave on. So one of the risks we, we took was to serve donuts for our audience here. So as we and wrap up, please. them on a wall. Please, I yeah, thought please. that was a risk. Cameron wanted to have a Hunger Games sort of competition <laughs> yeah. for the donuts. But, Everybody uh, just rushed the donuts. Yeah. Yeah. But please help yourself on the way out. To our audience on uh, WebEx and Facebook, thank you so much for joining us, uh, sharing in the, your converse, uh, in the conversation. If you've enjoyed this conversation, sign up for our podcast. RBC Disruptors through SoundCloud, Apple or Google or whatever your uh, favorite podcast platform is. Uh, share it, uh, rate us, that helps us grow, uh, grow the audience. Our next Disruptors, October 16th on how to scale a startup company will be uh, broadcasting from the CIX uh, conference and then back here October 24th for the future of healthcare and the disruption of healthcare uh, with a couple of really interesting guests. But Cameron and Joanna, thank you for joining us here today, and thank congratulations you. on all you've done at TIFF. Thanks very much. Thank you.